Okay, we're glad to have you with us this evening. We're in the book of Exodus. Uh, tonight we'll be starting in chapter 9. We're on the talking about the fifth plague. So it's halfway through the ten plagues that God's bringing upon Egypt. Uh, and we'll notice, I think, from here on out, that it's going to get progressively worse as far as the effect they'll have on the Egyptian people and upon Pharaoh. So we'll begin here looking at that, the fifth plague, the disease on cattle. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about maybe what that disease is that, uh, that's being given to them. But we'll be looking at verses 1 through 7. This is one of the shortest uh, accounts of the plagues given. Uh, only seven verses here, but as we look at that, and I'm reading from the uh, New King James Version, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go in to Pharaoh and tell him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will be on your cattle in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the oxen, and on the sheep, a very severe pestilence. And the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. So nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. Then the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. So the Lord did this thing on the next day. And all the livestock of Egypt died, but of the livestock of the children of Israel not one died. Then Pharaoh sent, and indeed not even one of the livestock of the Israelites was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh became hard, and he did not let the people go. So as we begin, we begin looking at this passage here and talking about this particular plague, a plague on the cattle. Uh, as you look at this, these first four verses are more or less a warning that God's giving to Pharaoh. He's done this before. Uh, to let them know ahead of time what they can expect if they do not obey Him. Uh, and yet in spite of that, Pharaoh continues to refuse to obey God. And uh, I just now that just crossed my mind to think about that. You know, God's given us a warning about what's going to happen to us if we do not obey Him. Uh, we've get, been given time to prepare for that. And, and over and over again, that's what God's doing for these Egyptian people and for Pharaoh. And when they don't obey, you see the end results that comes upon them, the plagues that are brought upon them. That ought to be a message to us. You know, we, we can't expect to escape the judgment of God if we're going to be like Pharaoh and just refuse to do what He says. And so every one of these things, we're looking at all of these plagues we talk about, are plagues uh, that, that ought to be teaching us a lesson about our responsibilities to obey God and do His will. Uh, first of all, God lets them know that the plague that's coming is a pestilence that he's going to be bringing upon. And he says it'll be upon all of Pharaoh's cattle in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, and on the sheep. But God says it will not affect any of the livestock of his people Israel. God's making a distinction here again between his people and the people of Israel. So that they will understand when this comes that this is the work of the God of the Israelites. It's not just a God among many. This is the God. And He's the God of the Hebrews. And Pharaoh needs to understand that, and that's why he needs to let the Hebrew people go free. Now, it begins talking about this plague He's going to bring upon them. The text here says it calls it a pestilence. And it's interesting that a number of different terminologies are used in reference to this disease that He's bringing upon the cattle. If you've got a King James Version, what does it say? Moraine. And we're not sure about that. that. Some believe this comes out of the French language, out of a, a word there that means uh, death. Uh, others believe it comes from the Greek uh, moraino, which means to grow lean or to waste away. The end result of which would be death. Uh, the word that's used there, though, is, is a word in the original language. Uh, Deber is what's given of it in the English letters. Uh, but this particular word is used variously. Uh, the Septuagint, that's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. When they translated it, they used the Greek word thanopsis or thanatos, which means death. Uh, the Vulgate, the Latin translation, uh, has pestis, which means a plague or a pestilence that he's going to bring upon them. And so uh, the old Saxon uh, gave it meaning to die. 
uh, used of any fatal disease. And it's interesting, one book that I was looking at on this uh, gave a description of what this pestilence would be like, how it would affect the cattle uh, or any of these animals that are affected by it. Uh, the symptoms include, it says, uh, are a hanging down of the head, and sw head swelling, abundance of gum in the eyes, rattling in the throat, difficulty of breathing, palpitation of the heart, staggering, a hot breath and a shiny tongues, which symptoms prove that a general inflammation is taking a place and the result's going to be death. And so God's letting them know ahead of time, if you don't obey me this time, it's going to mean the death of all your livestock. Now, up until this time, you think about the other four plagues that God has brought. What kind of effect have those plagues had on the people? Inconvenience. You know, the water turned to blood. Now, that's an inconvenience. You've got to dig your own wells to get water to drink. So that's an inconvenience. Uh, the frogs. Uh, well, they're all around the place in the house, you're kneading bowls, you know, in your bed and everything. Uh, you don't read of anybody getting sick or dying from it, but it's an inconvenience. It's something just drive a person crazy. The same thing is true uh, in, in regard to the gnats or the lice. Uh, something that's going to be very aggravating to the people. Uh, not necessarily something you're going to have to worry about your life, but boy, having lice or gnats, whatever it is, it's just something that can aggravate and drive a person crazy. You know, all these things that he talks about. But when you get here to the, I mean, well, the flies, I mentioned flies, uh, again, if they're biting flies, and many believe they were, again, something that's aggravating to you. But now it's getting to the point where the effect that this place is going to have is, is going to be a death of all your livestock. Now you stop and think about the, the different things we talked about that God mentions there. Uh, that's going to happen. He, in the cattle, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, and the oxen, and the sheep. Now, what are all those animals, what's the importance of them to the Egyptian people? All right, number of food to provide that, to provide transportation. What else? Clothing. You could get, you know, from the wool of the sheep. What else? What are, could could be milk. Uh, the work that they do. You gotta have the oxen to pull your carts, to pull your plows, to pull the wagons, uh, and things of that nature. So I mean it's something and not only is it affecting the, the, the livestock, they're gonna die as a result, but it's going to affect the Egyptian people because all of their livelihood uh, is dependent upon these things. Without those animals, you know, just think if, if suddenly if every mechanical vehicle, every car, truck, whatever is taken away from our society, what that would mean. You know, you, you get reminded every once in a while you get behind one of these semi-trucks and get aggravated by being... But they usually have something on to remind you, you know, uh, of how much they do in carrying produce across the nation to the people that are in need of that, you know, and, and so forth. So, you know, uh, if something like that happens to you, it's a big, big effect on your life. It just destroys things for you as far as that goes. So that's the problem they're having here because all of these animals are going to be affected. Uh, something else that got... Oh, excuse me. I'm just going to point out that it, he, he was very specific. God was... It was once just in the field so it didn't affect the livestock that were being boarded uh, at that particular time. Right. Uh, now, that's not mentioned in these particular verses here as it's going to be brought up later. Here it says, you know, he's talking about the cattle in the field. Now, if all of them were in the field, he'd say the cattle in the field, the horses in the field, the donkeys, or else put in the field at the end of all of them, he doesn't. So the others, maybe it, it's not represented. But later on, as he talks about this, he is talking about all these animals, and all of them are in the field. But it's only when the people listen to the warning that God gave, at least some of them did, they put their animals uh, in, into shelters so that they would be protected. So that, that, that's the warning that He gives to them here. Now, in this particular plague also, God set the time for that. Uh, well, tomorrow. 
kept pushing this button, he wasn't going anywhere. Uh, but tomorrow, uh, that's when it's going to happen. Uh, sometimes the plagues that he brings come about immediately. Uh, but this is one of two times when God says it'll be tomorrow. Now that's significant. And that's important to the Egyptian people and the Pharaoh. Why? I mean, if God says, okay, it begins now. Oh, and by the way, your cattle that are out in the field are going to be killed, you know. But when He tells them that first and then says it's going to be tomorrow that this place is going to be, it gives them ample time, if they believe God, it gives them ample time to get their animals into a shelter to protect them uh, or to give Pharaoh time to say, okay, I, I give in. Uh, God, I'm going to do what you say. I'll let your people go. So don't bring this plague upon us. So they're being given time uh, to make plans and carry out what needs to be done to avoid the death of their livestock. The only problem here is that you always have the same problem though with Pharaoh, and that is that he's stubborn. Uh, he's not going to listen to God. He chooses not to do God what God says. And so uh, he's not going to let Israel go. And that's going to be the reason why this plague is going to be brought upon them. Now, in doing this, again, this shows the power that God has over the gods of the Egyptians. Again, I, I wish I could... Uh, there's got to be somewhere they give the pronunciation for all these. Uh, Ta, Hathor, Nebus, and Ammon. All of these were Egyptian gods that had something to do with cattle, with the bulls. Uh, and, and so the, the cattle that are going to be destroyed by this. The gods the Egyptians are worshiping are not going to be able to protect these cattle because God's going to destroy them. And so again, that just emphasizes the power that God has over them so that these things uh, are going to take place. And just as God said, all of these cattle will be destroyed. Now, with that in mind then, uh, go here to the sixth plague. Uh, and like I said, you notice these things are getting worse. Uh, we've had things that were inconvenienced, that would drive the people crazy. Now you've got something that's destroying their livestock and they're by also, you know, uh, hurting uh, for a while their ability to carry on their work and, and everything that needs to be done in their society with all of those animals being put to death. But now the next thing that comes about is something that's going to start afflicting the people, particularly the people and the animals. And that is uh, the sixth plague, boils and sores that are coming upon the people. And so as we look at this, this begins at verse 8, and, and we'll read through verse 12, the first part of this. He says, So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take for yourselves handfuls of ashes from a furnace, and let Moses scatter it toward the heavens in the sight of Pharaoh. And it will come, become fine dust in all the land of Egypt. And it will cause boils that break out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. Then they took ashes from the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses scattered them toward heaven. And they caused boils that break out in sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the boils were on the magicians and on all... the the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. So this time with the boils and sores upon the beast and also upon the people. Now the word beast that's used here can apply not just to the domesticated animals that they have used, but also any of the wild animals would be affected by that. And the people are certainly going to be affected by it. Uh, now, the third plague, the plague of gnats, is one that came without warning. Uh, and now this one seems to come without warning. I know there's some believe that, that there's indication, verse 12, that maybe God had given warning to them. Uh, verse 12 says, But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not heed them. But he did not heed them. That could have occurred after the plague came. That's when he... He hardens his heart and refuses to do what God says. So it may be like that third plague. This is something that happens without warning to the people. And this is something a little bit different too. 
Uh, he tells them to take ashes out of the furnace and have Moses to throw it up into the air and it would become dust. And evidently, uh, it's going to produce these boils and sores on people. And evidently, those who were nearby and it settled on them, it immediately caused those boils upon them. But then it quickly spread throughout the entire land. I doesn't necessarily mean the ashes spread out throughout the land, the land on everybody, but the plague does. All of the boils and the sores that are produced by those boils come upon the people. Now, what is significant about taking ashes out of the furnace and producing this plague? What were the furnaces used for? Burning what? All right. <laughs> yeah, it, it could be used, the furnace could be used, that have altars for used for making sacrifices. All right, for making things uh, that had to be hardened, uh, whether it's bricks or not, uh, it was used for that purpose of having to build things. Uh, but also, uh, it, it was used to produce these ashes or this dust. Uh, now, for instance, they, they would take limestone and heat it up in a furnace uh, and, until everything's burned out and it just becomes dust. Uh, and that dust would be lime. So what's important about lime? It, it could be used for a number of different reasons, but I'm thinking about, you know, uh, farming. Uh, my father-in-law, I know there are a lot of those things that crops would have. He, he would side dress that with lime. Uh, and so, what's that? Yeah, and so, you know, it, it, it was a value to the people for that purpose. Uh, you used it in agricultural work that you need that. But of course, there was other uses for lime too that they would have for it. But this is something that was extremely important to the Egyptian people. They needed these furnaces to be able to, to make metals, to, to reduce that, you know, to, uh, you put it into the fire, burn out all the impurities, all of that ore, and what's left is the metal, and then that metal they could use to get iron, uh, to make their weapons, to make their chariots. Uh, they could use it to get out gold or silver that they would need, and so it was important to them for that reason, but also it was important to them agriculturally. And so, here you are, you've got something that's of extreme importance to the uh, Egyptian people and to their culture and to their way of life. And suddenly, God is using that to bring a plague upon them. And we talked about how God can use any and every little thing. It's at His command, and He can use it to bring a plague upon people. And so all of these people are suffering and, and the gods that they serve cannot help them. They cannot escape that. But it's all because of the fact that they're not listening to God to do what God wanted them to do. Uh, I was going to ask, could that, could that have been more for a sign for Pharaoh because he told him to go throw it up in front of Pharaoh? Well, he just it's just... I mean, I'm saying, I guess God could produce boils without dust. Yeah, well, I think the reason he's using the dust is because, see, look, I'm using that which is important to you. I, I've used the Nile River that you've trusted in that's so important to you. Uh, I've used the, the dirt that comes out when that Nile overflows and it lays down. You get that good uh, ground there for growing crops. I've used that to bring plagues against you. Anything and everything is at God's disposal, and that's one of the things that he does here. Now, it produces boils upon the people. Uh, and again, looking at some of the Bible dictionaries that I have, uh, points out basically that the word boils here can refer to a variety of different skin inflammations. Uh, there are things that can cause uncleanness to a person. Uh, you have that in the old law, Leviticus chapter 13 and verse 20, uh, when a person uh, has to go to the priest to determine whether or not what he has is something that's going to make him unclean and keep him separated from other people. Leviticus 13.20 says, And if, when the priest sees it, 
It indeed appears deeper than the skin, and its hair is turned white. The priest shall pronounce him, uh, pronounce him unclean. It is a leprous sore which is broken out of the boil. So it's some, a boil that appeared first, and later uh, it became leprous. And so the person is unclean. He has to be separated from the people until the time that he can be clean again. Yes, sir, Jack? That, I think that's a valid assumption, that it did not affect them. Uh, he, he's kept their cattle from being uh, destroyed. You know, and I, I should have mentioned that Pharaoh even sent people over to examine and see. And they came back and said, hey, you know, none of the cattle, none of the cro uh, livestock of the Israelites, none of them have died. But all of yours have died. So that makes it clear. But I, I think you would assume here that since he's protected their animals, he's certainly going to protect the people from these types of things. These boils and sores that are coming about are things that can be extremely painful thing. Uh, the first thing that came to my mind is, is Job. Uh, Job chapter 2 and, and verse 7 talks about it. Uh, it. says, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Uh, and I think I've mentioned this before. He had so many boils that in the Hebrew it doesn't say boils, plural. It just says boil. It's just his whole body is just like one gigantic boil. And so what did Job do when he was afflicted like that? Yeah, he went out, you know, to sit in the ashes and take a piece of broken pottery and scrape that, those sores off of him. Uh, and just think about having something like that painful that you have. Well, all of the Egyptians are stricken with some type of boil and the boil itself produces sores. So there, there are other things that are complicated uh, by this that comes upon the people. And especially, I mean, though all the Egyptians are affected, and I believe that includes Pharaoh, the one group specifically mentioned is who? The magicians. They're afflicted. And evidently, it was so severe on them, the text says, that they couldn't stand before Moses and Aaron. Now, every time when they'd brought a plague earlier, the magicians have always been there. The first three, hey, the magicians show it. We can do the same thing. But the fourth one, no, we can't do that. This is the finger of God. And, and with all the rest of them, it gets worse and worse. But the magicians are always there. But this time, they can't stand there before Moses and Aaron. They're not there to oppose them. They can't. And evidently, the, the affliction on them is so severe you know, they don't feel like coming out. Uh, you know, it, it would have had to have been something terribly wrong or painful to cause them to do that. Now, one thing also that, that I never noticed, not paid any attention to, and I don't think anybody would have a reason to even notice this, but uh, some of the books that I've read said this is the last time you read about the magicians in the book of Exodus. So, uh, you know, they, they, they're not going to appear again in any way to be there to support Pharaoh uh, or to suggest that Moses and Aaron are not able to really do this by their own power. Uh, you know, this is just trickery. They're, they're not going to appear again. They're gone. Uh, now, something else is interesting too here about verse 12. Uh, and this is the first time. Uh, see, here I get by. It says, The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And that's the first time it said that. Now it's talked about Pharaoh have a hardened heart uh, on other occasions. Uh, it, chapter 7 and verse 22, chapter 8 and verse 19, chapter 9 and verse 7, chapter 9 and verse 35, says Pharaoh's heart was hardened. But it doesn't say who did it. Uh, in chapter 8 and verse 32, it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. But this time here, in chapter 9, verse 12, it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now it's going to say it more after that. There are ten different times it talks about his heart being hardened. And it's interesting, ten plagues, ten times his heart's hardened. But four of those times, uh, it just says 
His heart was hard, but didn't say who did it. But from here on out, it talks about God hardening his heart. Chapter 7, verse 3. Yeah. Well, which translation you, you got? Do American Standard. Do American Standard. It didn't have it in mind, so I'm just wondering. It's a variation or something. Seven, seven, three. Yeah, uh, the, yeah. That says I will harden Pharaoh's heart. That's probably why I didn't pick that up. I just put in there, harden Pharaoh's heart, or the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. But that's where God is speaking. And God said, I will harden his heart. Now, he didn't do that every time, evidently, because sometimes it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. And sometimes it just says his heart was hardened. But now there, there's a problem with that. If you take this that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, what problem could that present? Yeah, that makes it sound like Pharaoh had no choice in this. He, he's not a free moral agent. He's just a puppet that God's using. And, and he can only do what God will allow him to do. And so, you know, God said, okay, let my people go. But, hey, Pharaoh can't let them go because God's hardened his heart to make sure that he won't let them go. And so that's one of the problems. that you can, Well, how can you explain that away? In what sense could God have hardened his heart? Now, I don't believe that he made Sarah, obeyed Pharaoh to harden his heart. I don't think he made him to refuse to obey God. But in what sense could God it be said that God hardened his heart? Brandon, I know you've got that new Bible too. Do you have anything in there on that? Oh, there... Yeah, it, it'd take a while to read everything they have to say on that. But just to try to put it down as briefly as possible, two things that, that need to be understood about it. Number one, uh, God simply gave the opportunity for Pharaoh to harden his own heart. God gave the opportunity for his heart to be hardened. <coughs> and so in that sense, God may have done it, but there's another thing too I want to mention. If he didn't harden his heart, how would he know that he's not going to let people go? Because God knows everything. And you know, God comes and says, but he will not, he's foretelling the future, but mm -hmm. he will not let you go. Yeah. Uh, so I mean if, if he's not doing it and Pharaoh's free moral agent then how does God can say for sure that He will not? Live? Because God knows everything. He knows the future. And He can tell the future. And He can tell you what Pharaoh's going to freely choose to do. The same way with, with us. Uh, but another thing about that, that is the fact that there are several times in the Bible when it talks about someone doing something when we know that individual did not actually do it, it's only they've done it, you know, uh, not literally, but it's a sign to them that it was done by somebody else. But one example. Right. Yeah. So the Bible talks about how that, but Judas' money that he was given for trade, for uh, turning Jesus against him those 30 pieces of silver, uh, that he used that to buy the field. But before that field was purchased, he took the money back, threw it down in the temple, and they said, this is blood money, we can't put it in the treasury. So they, those priests, took that money and bought a field, and that's where, uh, for burial, that's where Judas uh, uh, goes and hangs himself, you know. And so they attribute to him purchasing it because his money that he had had was used. But he's not the one that really bought it. Same, same way and so, with God in the, the burning bush speaking to Moses, an angel, 
from the burning bush or God that led Israel. It was actually his representative angels yep. that went before them and led them through the wilderness. And sometimes it, it says the angel of the Lord, yeah. which many people believe is a reference to Christ. Right. And I said, oh, I, God's making them believe a lie. No. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and He will allow any of us to believe a lie because we're free moral agents. He's not going to force. But that's not Him forcing us to do it. He had deceiving spirits that He would send also. That's what He was talking about there. Well, I mean, I mean, in the Old Testament, the deceiving spirit, when He had, had them go before Him, they went before Him who can I send? Oh, and when he sent the deceiving spirit that went to, to make them uh, false prophets. Right. And so you have false prophets, but but those false right, but those false prophets are not being forced to do that. They're doing it freely. And so when it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, no, God allowed it to happen. Uh, Right? At any time. that He could have. But He didn't. And that's why I say, you know, each time when God warns them about what's going to happen, if they don't obey and they refuse to obey, it's their fault. You know, it's not God's not forcing that upon them. Okay, I have to keep up with my time here. Uh, so, again, this plague that He brings here, the boils and sores that produced upon the people, uh, again, shows the power that God has over the gods of Egypt, of those that they worship. Uh, I don't think I put their names up there this time, but uh, <coughs> there was uh, uh, Sekhmet, the goddess of epidemics, uh, Serapis, and Inhoptep. They were the Egyptian gods of healing. So these boils and sores, their gods couldn't heal them, and their gods could not prevent it. And so it's all by the power of God doing this. He has power over those gods that the Egyptians were worshiping. And that's proved over and over again with each of the plagues that God brings upon them. Now, the seventh plague, uh, a plague of hail. Now this is, this is a rather lengthy one. Begins at verse 13, goes through verse 35. Uh, we're going to break that up in the smaller parts to look at the essence. So I want to begin, first of all, the first section talks about the purpose of the plagues. And that's verses 13 through 17. Uh, okay. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For at this time I will send all my plagues to your very heart and on your servants and on your people that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Now if I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed for this purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. As yet you exalt yourself against my people, and that you will not let them go. So, as we look about, look at this. Number one, first thing that's emphasized here, the beginning words, is the fact that God has not changed His requirements of Pharaoh. Uh, you know, sometimes you can get so tired of trying to uh, to reach some people, you know, and over and over and over again, and they keep no, 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 and, and you start searching. Uh, and so maybe you may be tempted uh, to compromise a little bit to see if I can't get them moving. Uh, in the right direction. But God doesn't compromise here with Pharaoh. Uh, he, he's demanding the same thing of him throughout. And he does so here. So he begins, you know, when he tells him, you go before Pharaoh and here's what you say, thus says the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. Uh, he's not going to relent. He's not going to give up on that. He has the same demand that he's making upon them that they would do it. But Pharaoh is stubborn. And he will not do what God wants him to do. And so God says, there are other plagues I'm going to send. Now, he's never said that before. You know, uh, 
He'd bring one plague. Pharaoh doesn't respond. Then he might warn him, okay, I'm bringing another plague. Here's, here's what's going to happen to you next. Sometimes he doesn't warn them. But God never tells them, well, okay, I'm not just going to bring another plague. I'm going to bring plagues, plurality of them. that are going to come upon you, upon you and upon all your people so you'll know that I am the true God. Uh, so they will know that. But as he talks about bringing these plagues upon them uh, on this occasion, uh, he talks about his purpose for doing that. Now God said, if my purpose was simply, well, when we think about it, first of all, what do we normally, what's the purpose for God doing, all, for bringing these plagues upon them? What's he trying to do? Make you mad. No. Everything we've talked about so far, God's doing this to get Pharaoh, let my people go. But God says here, listen, if that's what I wanted, if that's all I wanted was to free my people, I could have killed every one of you. I could have killed you and all of your people and my people could have walked out free and they wouldn't have just gone out taking some of your wealth. They could have taken every bit of it with them. But God said, that's not my purpose here. It's, it's to free my people. That's part of it. But my purpose is to show my power in you and so that that will spread to all the earth. Everybody will know about who I am and what kind of God I am and the power I am and that I surpass all other gods. I am the God of all the world. And that's why God's doing that. That's what the stated purpose here is to cause Pharaoh to understand that but also all the world to know it. Uh, he says, for this purpose I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Now later on here in the book of Exodus, chapter 18, when Moses uh, returns uh, and, and he meets his father-in-law Jethro again and Jethro comes out to speak to him uh, and the text tells us in verse 1 of chapter 18, and Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. So his father-in-law, who's still up there in Midian, he's heard about everything that God's done. But they're not the only one. You remember, and you get to the book of Joshua, and Joshua's going to be the one to lead them in to take the land. Uh, and they send out the 12 spies. And remember those two spies that were hidden by Rahab. Uh, and do you remember what Rahab told those two spies? Yeah, we've heard of what God's done for you. We've heard about Him uh, dividing the Red Sea so you could walk across on dry ground. And we heard what He did to the kings of Og and Bashan uh, and, and allowed you to take that land from them. And she says, when we heard these things, our hearts melted within us. They, they had no more strength, no more courage just because they had heard about the power of the God of Israel. And so over and over again, that's emphasized. Then you get to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 8. Uh, this is a time now when the Philistines have come down to do battle against Israel and initially Israel has been defeated and they're going to be defeated again by the Philistines. But when they're defeated that first time, they, they, they said, look, we, we need to get the Ark of the Covenant up here. They thought that's, that's the, you know, that shows God's presence. So they bring the Ark of the Covenant up there and all the Jews, you know, they, they begin shouting, you know, when the Philistines heard it, you know, they, they thought, what is this? But God's coming to the camp. And in 1 Samuel 4, verse 8, the Philistines said, Woe to us! Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. And so they've heard about it. God said, that's the reason I'm using these plagues. I didn't just destroy all of you immediately to free my people. I could have done that. But I want to show my power in you so that will spread throughout the world and everybody will know about the God of Israel. And so that's why He's done this. Now, as you continue looking at this, we'll just, we have just got a couple of minutes here. Uh, the warning that God gives to them about this next plague that He's bringing. Uh, beginning at verse 18, uh, well, 
Holy totally Spirit. There we go. Begin at verse 18. Behold, tomorrow about this time, I will cause very heavy hail to rain down, such as has not been in Egypt since its founding until now. Therefore, send now and gather your livestock and all that you have in the field, for the hail shall come down on every man and every animal which is found in the field and is not brought home, and they shall die. He who feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his livestock flee to the houses. But he who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. The hailstorm is coming. God said it's going to be something like that Egypt has never seen. Not from the time you became a nation until this time you've never seen anything like what God's fixing to do to you. Uh, now all of us here, I'm, I'm sure all of us have seen hail before, but have you really seen a, a, a real hailstorm? I mean... I lived in Crossville, Tennessee for three years, and thankfully the year after I moved, the hailstorm hit. And friends of ours sent us pictures of it. He had gathered up hailstones, some of them as big as a baseball, getting close to the size of a softball. And he showed me some of the structures there in Crossville. Some of these metal buildings, uh, they were huge silo-like type thing, and they were just crushed completely to the ground by that. And, and so that's the type of thing we're talking about here that God brings. And later on when God will talk about, you know, fighting for Israel and he causes, uh, throws down stones upon them, it may have been hailstones that God was throwing down upon them to destroy their enemy. Uh, stone, hailstones of that size can kill a person. And so God is warning them again ahead of time about this plague. And he says, tomorrow, again, tomorrow I'm going to do that. He's giving them time if they believe what he said, to get all of their animals uh, into a place of safety. Uh, some did that, and some did not. Uh, but such hail that comes forth was certainly capable of killing people. Now, uh, there's, a a there's a psalm in there that talks about, oh, it's in Job, not in Psalms, but it's in Job where he talks about storing up hail for his battles mm -hmm. to the Lord. Who knows? You know where the Lord stores His hail for His battles. It's over in, somewhere right there around Job thirty something, but where He uses it to do His battles with, and He has a, He talks about the storerooms of hail. Right. That he keeps for his I, I'll have to look that up and see. I not not familiar with that. Right there about the, where the ostrich and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Now here as He talks about you know th this plague of hail is coming upon men upon the livestock, and upon the fields, whatever they have planted at that time. All of that's going to be destroyed. Now we'll look at this next week because our time's gone, but I've got some pictures of some of these things to see that. Yes, sir? Yeah, it may be that first time that all of them were killed were those who were killed in the field and not the others that might have been put up. Also, it could be, some have pointed out, you know, it's possible that they could have, uh, Pharaoh could have, after that destruction, and we're not told how long it was before the next plague came, he might have purchased more uh, animals for that from other nations. But we'll talk about that next time. Let's close out with a word of prayer, please. Father, we thank you again for allowing us this time to be together and pray you'll be with us as we go to our homes to bless us and keep us safe and Allow us, Father, to be back this coming Sunday. We pray your continued blessings upon thy people here that we, Father, might help to move your kingdom forward and to bring other souls unto thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.